even many Christians wonder whether Genesis should be read as historical narrative or not. Did God really say? This week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Our topic this week is, did God really say? How, do, how are we supposed to understand Genesis? You may have heard this in the past, something like this. Genesis should not be read as real history. It's just a poetic account of, of the creation of the universe given to simple, the simple and unscientific Hebrew culture who would not have understood the sophisticated theory of evolution. Uh, <laughs> these kinds of statements are commonly used among theistic evolutionists, for example, those who believe that God used evolution to create over millions of years to convince others that biblical creationism is untenable in our modern scientific world. Right, and it's actually a circular argument because by assuming evolution is true, uh, you assume that people were simpler in the past, in the past right. and so that uh, that means they wouldn't have understood the complicated theory of evolution, so then God kept it really simple for them. So it's a circular argument. Right, but if you assume that the history of the Bible is true, then you understand that people started off incredibly bright and have been suffering from degeneration ever since that time. Yes. Now, um, as, as far as the idea that evolution is too complicated for, for simple folks um, to, to understand, a Canadian book designer uh, has uh, got a book out to teach evolution to children ages 8 to 13. Wow. And that's probably come as a surprise to some of these people. It's called Evolution, um, How We and All Living Things Came to Be by author uh, Daniel Loxton. And it, it won the 2010 Lane Anderson Award in the Young uh, Reader Science category and was a finalist for the prestigious Silver Birch Awards. So okay. they're teaching uh, this sophisticated theory to quite young people. Seems to work and it's receiving rave reviews from skeptic and pro-evolution <laughs> groups. Uh, here are some of the comments from leading atheist and evolutionist one, sources. And uh, one was, an excellent resource for both students and teachers fills a gap in books about evolution for this age group. Right, and another one, Loxton hits the key concepts perfectly and without being stuffy about it. Here's another one, explains the facts simply without distorting the science for the young reader. Right. Okay, so it is possible. Yeah. The book review on the overtly atheistic uh, skeptic.com states this. Um, Can something as complex and wondrous as the natural world be explained by a simple theory? The answer is yes. So similarly, if evolution was the way God created, why couldn't Moses have written something like, in the beginning, the Lord created the first living thing, and this creature's offspring changed slowly over time, eventually becoming every living thing across the entire earth. I mean, that would have been pretty easy to communicate of course. and to understand. And, and I mean, it's the same stuff they're teaching you know, kindergarten children today, of course, minus the God part. Right, so, yeah. Uh, there were also many could have used in Genesis to communicate vast eons of time, if that's what he had intended. Surely adults comprehending complex laws like those in Deuteronomy, for example, <laughs> uh, could have understood such straightforward concepts. Right. These, these ideas are taught to kinder, <laughs> kindergarten age children all over the Western world, yeah. uh, you know, such as Loxton's own son. He, he, he quotes, he says, I've got a five-year-old son, and when I tell him that he's actually part of the same family as everything else on earth that ever existed, that understanding uh, kind of shines out of his eyes. Wow. <laughs> so what's his key to communicating to young people? He says, uh, the trick to writing for kids, he says, is not to dumb it down. They just need the best information available, he said. Keep it simple, but make it true. <laughs> and of course, oh. uh, we agree. We don't agree with his information that he's giving, and that's right. why we, yep. we produce Creation Magazine. CMI produces Creation Magazine. That's why we uh, have Creation Magazine I, uh, alive. And of course, we've got accurate uh, material uh, for all ages. Just go to our web store. Right, yeah. As a matter of fact, it only takes a person of, let's say, average intelligence to understand what Genesis plainly says. Mm -hmm. 
It's only when people try to add millions of years in evolution that it becomes difficult and complicated to understand. Exactly. Perhaps doubters in a plain reading of Genesis should understand uh, we don't need to look to sources outside of the Bible to interpret it. God kept right. it simple, yeah. and of course it's true. We don't need um, scientists that don't believe God's Word to take information and, and, and give it to us so that now we can somehow discover uh, what the Bible was supposed to plainly say. Right. And we'll be back in 60 seconds. Copying the work or design of another person without giving them due credit is called plagiarism. But even though plagiarism is widely regarded as a terrible thing, ironically, it has actually inspired a whole new field of science known as biomimetics. As the name suggests, biomimetics involves mimicking or copying designs seen in the biological world. For instance, the geometric eyes of lobsters have inspired X-ray telescope design, and the amazing properties of spider silk are inspiring chemists in the production of ultra-strong materials. Since scientists are continually uncovering excellent examples of design in nature that are worth copying, isn't it reasonable to conclude that our creator must have designed them? And if they are copying the work of a creator and not giving him due credit, isn't that just another form of plagiarism? Romans chapter 1 speaks of those who do not honour God for what he has created. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in, this week we're talking about Genesis. Is it historical? Many Christians around the world today believe that God used the Big Bang and the processes of stellar evolution in a gradual, uh, gradual geolo geological change over millions of years, those kinds of things, mm -hmm. to make the world what it is today. Some people also believe that God used the process of neo-Darwinian evolution to bring the different life forms into existence. The former are called progressive creationists and the latter are called theistic evolutionists. Now when confronted with what the Bible says about origins, many of these Christians have argued that God couldn't have communicated that he uh, created in this manner to people in a pre-scientific age. That's what we were talking about in the last segment there. Right, they, they say that Genesis was written uh, in, the way, in, in that way because the ancient Hebrews, for instance, would not have understood today's sophisticated cosmological and geological and biological theories. That's what they're yeah. saying. Well, let's explore this uh, a little more deeply right. by using this uh, simple vocabulary of Genesis to show how God could have said it if indeed he had created as, as progressive creationists or theistic evolutionists imagine. See if this sounds right to you as we read this re-rendering of Genesis. When God uh, began to create the heavens and earth, he expanded a small grain of dust and said, let there be light, and it eventually became so. From this grain of dust, over many ages, he formed the stars and then the sun, and finally, after a long age, the earth and the moon, and the earth was hot and dry. There was no water anywhere on the earth. Very nice, okay. So continuing on, slowly God caused the seas to come forth, and from the water he formed exceedingly small creatures in the sea and said, be fruitful and multiply and slowly change into fish and plants of the sea and creeping things and animals and plants on the land and the birds of the sky. And after thousands upon multiplied thousands of years, as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashore, it was so. It seems pretty easy to understand. Yeah. Let's continue. But in those days, there were terrors on the land and in the sky, and many also fell prey to a host of terrible plagues. Animals were eating each other and killing with poisonous stings, and from time to time, many of the creatures that God had made died and were buried and were no more, but new ones arose to take their place. Then after a further number of long ages, God said, let us make man in our image. So God took one of the animals that, he'd ar that had arisen, which looked like a man but wasn't, and God breathed his spirit into this creature so that it was changed into a man. And God called the man Adam. In like manner, God made a woman also, and Adam called her Eve. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and it was so. And from this pair came all the people of the earth. Wow, this is really sophisticated. Yeah, <clears throat> hard to understand. After many generations, these, those people who lived in the land around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, called Assyria, became exceedingly wicked. God found only Noah to be righteous on the earth, and he said, I will send a flood to destroy all the sinful people. So God told Noah, take your wife and your three sons and your wives and your animals and move to the land that I will show you. There I will protect you from the flood that will soon come upon Assyria and this people. <laughs> it's hard to say. Here we go. 
Uh, and Noah and his family obeyed God, and they, were, they alone were saved, along with their animals, and other people in the land of Assyria died, along with some of the creatures there. The birds which had flown away once the waters began to rise returned soon after, and Noah and his family multiplied and gradually divided into different languages and tribes and spread all over the earth. From one of those tribes, God called a man named Abraham. And now we're up to Genesis 12. So there's there a go. rewriting of, well, a summary of Genesis 1 to 11. Yeah, done according to what theistic <laughs> abolitionists or, you know, age theorists, et cetera, would say. Now, now having read this uh, fictitious um, rewriting of Genesis 1 to 11, if someone uh, then reads the biblical text, the contrast is pretty stark, right? If God created right. over millions of years and flooded the earth with merely a local flood in the Mesopotamian Valley, uh, you know, modern day Iraq, he could not have been more misleading in the way God actually wrote exactly. yeah. the Bible. I mean, you know, this is kind of funny and, and it was kind of hard to read it that way, actually, because it's, but it could it's have kind been, of... That's, that's understandable. If evolution is true and millions of years happened, it could have been written in the way we just did this little paraphrase crazy thing here. Yeah. It, and, and it's understandable. That's right. It, it, Absolutely would have been understandable. It wouldn't have been hard for God to actually display it this way. And it just shows that this argument that we so often hear yeah. from evolution, yeah. theistic evolutionists and so on, uh, it just doesn't hold any water at all. Yeah. So something for people to consider if you do get confronted with this uh, argument, and we will be back in about 60 seconds to discuss it more. Creation Magazine is a 56-page full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. On this week's episode, we're talking about uh, how to interpret Genesis. Could it be something other than a historical narrative? Right, yeah. Now, we just showed how Genesis could have been written if God created over millions of years or used evolution. There's a huge contrast between that and the way that the text is written. Right. You can see that. Yeah. <laughs> However, if God, uh, one, created the universe and everything in it in six literal days about 6,000 years ago, then two, cursed the whole creation when Adam sinned, and then about uh, 1,600 years later, three, judged the whole world with a global catastrophe, yeah. a world rearranging flood at the time of Noah, and then four, supernaturally created different languages at the Tower of Babel to uh, precipitate the formation of nations, then we've got to ask this question. If God really did all this, how could he possibly have said it more clearly than he has in Genesis? Right. Yeah. Right? Uh, let's go through some verses and try to imagine what God should have said if Genesis was really supposed to take place in an evolutionary fashion. We'll read that version and put the actual biblical text beside it. Right. Let's start with uh, Genesis 1.5. And there was evening and there was morning. The first eon. <laughs> there, that's a Interesting verse. Yeah. How about Genesis 1, 14 to 19? I encourage people, if you're sitting at home right now, take your Bible out, look up the Bible verses, and, and then see the contrast. Genesis 1, 14 and 19. Uh, 14 to 19. And God said, Let lights in the vault of the sky appear to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let lights appear in the vault of the sky to give light uh, on the earth. And it was so. God caused the two great lights to appear as a cloud cover slowly dissipated, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser night to govern the night. He had also made the stars back in the first eon, long before the earth. God allowed them to appear in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth Eon. The fourth eon. Okay. Yeah. It's because some people are saying that, you know, God didn't create the sun on day four because that doesn't fit the evolutionary scenario. That's so right. he just revealed it on day four. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's, let's have a look at uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then after many years, as the number of grains of sand, God said, let us make man in our image 
So God took one of the animals that had arisen over these vast ages, which looked like a man but wasn't, and God breathed into his spirit, uh, breathed his spirit into this creature so that it was changed into a man. In like manner, God took a female hominid and made a companion for Adam. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and it was so. And from this first pair, and from many others also like them, came the people of the earth. Right. That's how you'd have to rewrite it to make it fit with... Yep. And, and how about Genesis 1, to 31? Yeah. Uh, now, we've covered this a little bit before, but I'll add a little bit. But in those days, there were terrors on the land and in the sky and in the seas, and many also fell prey to a host of terrible plagues. God gave humans and animals to each other for food. Some plants and animals killed with poisonous stings and bites. And from time to time, many of the creatures that God had made died and were buried and were no more. But new ones arose to take their place. Animals and humans suffered from gout, osteoporosis, and bone cancer. And God called this very good. He it's, called it very good. Well, see, that's the problem at with the any of, of these. At the end of his creation and all those diseases were taking place as God was creating over millions of years. Yeah, and it's all very good. Mm. Let's try another one. Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God took a few thousand hominids formed from ape-like ancestors through evolution and breathed into them, and they became spiritual beings. Now, there's a contrast between the dayagers who then believe the that, you know, there were ape-like hominids and then God, you know, breathed, and, or the evolutionary scenario where there yeah. was hundreds and they all, you know, yep. came together. Uh, Genesis 7, 18 to 23. Uh, this is the flood. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, on the land, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the land of Mesopotamia, yeah. and all the mountains under the skies were covered. Sky were covered. Every living thing in the land that moved perished: birds, livestock, wild animals, and all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything in the area that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the country was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the area. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark were safe, as well as all those living in the rest of the world unaffected by this flood. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, you can see the absurdity of this. More when we get back. What does a cow have in common with a compass needle? The answer is that both of them know the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field. No, this isn't crackpot science. In 2008, the prestigious journal The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA published research documenting how cows grazing in a field have a tendency to align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field. And this phenomenon isn't just limited to cows. Many animals, including deer, birds, turtles, bats, and even some bacteria, can sense the Earth's magnetic field for alignment or navigation. The fact that so many living things have this ability is rather ironic, considering that the famous evolutionist J.B.S. Haldane once said that evolution couldn't produce magnets. Just as man-made magnetic compasses are the product of forethought and design, so too the magnetic sensing in animals points to an intelligent designer. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject this week is, how should Genesis be understood? Well, we've been comparing how Genesis should or could have been written if evolutionary processes had actually occurred instead of biblical creation, what the text actually says. Right. Here's a few more that'll make you think, or, or cringe, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this is, this is satire. Please don't take offense. We're, we're, we're stating things in this way to highlight the respect that people should have mm. for God's word. Okay, now here, here's, here's a famous verse, Proverbs 1, 7. The empirical method is the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> right. A little off there. A little off. Yeah. yeah, Proverbs 3, 5, of course, says, Trust in science with all your heart and do not lead, uh, lean on the Lord's understanding. That's the way I memorized it. Right, right. <laughs> Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man is most important for today's Christians to maintain academic respectability, but he who trusts in the Lord is naive. <laughs> Ouch. Yes. John 3.12. If I, Jesus, have told you earthly things like the fact that Adam and Eve existed from the beginning of the creation and the global flood really occurred, and I'm wrong, don't worry. Just believe me anyway if I tell you heavenly things. Yeah, amazing. Uh, John 5.47. But if you do not believe his, referring to Moses' writings, 
It's not a problem because you can believe my Jesus words anyway. Right. How about Acts 17, 11? Now these Berean Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the word and the scriptures daily to test them according against uniformitarian science and reinterpreting them accordingly. Yeah, wow. That's what we ought to do, right? Uh, be like the Bereans. Yep. <laughs> Romans 1.20, here's a famous verse. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been invisible in nature, which looks like the result of survival of the fittest, so unbelievers have a good excuse. Wow, that's a powerful one. If yeah. God created evolution, then non-believers do have an excuse. Wow. If you can't look at God's creation to determine that design implies a design or that there's a creator there, then, then you get problems. that as a result. Crazy. Romans 8, 20 to 22. For the creation was always afflicted with futility because of him who created it that way, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that for millions of years, even billions, the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth until now. Yeah, uh -oh. well, here's another one, Romans 12, 2. Be conformed this, to this world and be transformed by the renewal of your mind towards secular academic thinking. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we affirm arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and make Christian teachings captive to every scientific thought. That's, that's about it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, here's another one, Colossians 2 verse 8, absorb modern philosophy and make sure you follow the tradition of men according to the rudiments of the world and accordingly judge the teachings of Christ. And doesn't it come down to that? Backwards. Christians there, judging yeah. God's word. That's it. Second Peter 3, 3 to 7. You must understand that in these last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it is since, from the, since the beginning of creation. But long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, one locality at that time was deluged and destroyed. But these scoffers understandably forget that because this local flood left no trace. Yeah, that's, that's about it. Right. And those are the way those verses could be, could be rewritten if, uh, if evolution or progressive creation is true. Yeah. It's just amazing. And I think there's probably a bit of ouch factor there even when we read those things. Doesn't it just kind of, to me, even speaking them, I mean, it's a parody, it's satire, but this is God's word that many Christians are actually... Yeah. reinterpreting that way. If you study what they're actually saying, that's the way it would it, have had to be written. It should probably be written, yeah. 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 So you know what? We've, we've got a brand new book that just came out. Well, we're recording this in 2015 here for broadcast next year, but yeah. the, the Genesis account mm. is the Rolls Royce of creation books. It is a verse-by-verse -verse commentary from Genesis 1 to 11. It does what normal commentaries do. It draws the meaning from the text, faithfully using the original Hebrew and so on, and it brings in the science. You can get that at 30% off when you check out at creation.com. Use the code CMLGA, Genesis account, and you can get 30% off of this amazing resource. We'll see you in a minute. Creation Ministries International edifies the body of Christ by providing more than 30 years of Bible-supporting scientific research, delivered through speaking engagements, books, magazines, and a variety of media, much of which is archived on our website, creation.com. Did you know that if you read three articles on creation.com each day, it would take over seven years to read them all? Such a wealth of information didn't arise by chance, however. We do this through the faithful prayers and gifts of our supporters, which also fund ongoing research. Support the building up of the church by partnering with CMI. Donate today at creation.com slash donate. Okay, welcome back. To round things out here, we're going to do. A, we're going to look at a feedback. We often get emails uh, and letters into our office mm -hmm. uh, globally, the seven offices around the world, with Creation Ministries. And here's one that came in. That the title that we put on it is: "Is God obscure and arbitrary in what He wants from us?" And the the the, the letter that came in, the email that came in, uh, a little bit uh, pointed. But uh, here here's what this person said. Uh, start with an analogy. You walk into a classroom, on the blackboard, the teacher has written on the board, you have one hour to find out what color 
of what color the box is. You're given 4,200 books, which were written thousands of years ago, all starting, all, all stating that the box is a particular color. Uh, you try asking your teacher questions about the box, but he doesn't reply. At the end of the hour, the teacher then rewards students that guessed the right color and sends the rest of the children to detention. You argue that it was logical to say that you didn't know because you knew nothing about the box, where it was, where, where, it, came, where it came from, etc. But this isn't a good enough excuse and you are sent to detention. How is this fair? The person asks. Mm -hmm. This is exactly how God treats his children, they state. Uh, if you do not believe this is fair, then God is unfair and why do you believe? Right. I've actually heard this uh, kind of argument used uh, from someone who used to call themselves a Christian. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's so, popular. They've phrased it in an interesting way here, but uh, yeah. it's a popular argument. So one of our, um, one of our folks, uh, CMI's Sean Doyle, uh, responded this way. There's little correspondence between your parable and how God treats us. For a start, your story assumes that God has left us completely in the dark about his power and majesty, which Christianity d denies. Right. We don't need the Bible to know we have a moral obligation to worship God and give thanks to him, and we don't need the Bible to know we fall far, false uh, short of honoring him properly. And then he quotes from Romans 1, 18 to 21. Right. Which is the whole key here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. Because what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. Right. Why? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks, but became futile in their thoughts and their senseless hearts were darkened. Yeah. See, this, is, this ties into what our topic was today. It does, yeah. Because the scripture makes it very clear that we can know God exists because of what he made. Right. And so when Christians adopt evolution, which really is saying that no, nothing's been designed, nothing's been created, it just happened through naturalistic forces, yeah. you've given people like this an excuse. So you've taken this passage here in Romans 1 and just chucked it, basically. Chucked so, it, no, which means true. you don't have an answer to questions like this that yeah. the person has put yeah. forward. So Look, that, we, we live in an information age, right? If people are wondering about how they can be reconciled to God, how the, the biggest question that anyone will ever face is, how can I escape the, the wrath of a holy God against my sin, against what I've done against God? That is the biggest question anyone can face. Right. We live in an information age. That information, the answer to how to do that, to how to be saved is everywhere. <laughs> Go to Google. Dude, like, it's, it's all over the place. Name a Christian website that doesn't have a gospel message. Right. It's all over the place. People yep. have no excuse. Yep. And you see that as well in, in nature. So we will see you next week. And uh, hopefully this was uh, a good way to help you understand why this is so important.